Welcome to UCL Lunch Hour Lectures. Uh, I know this is a long tradition, but I've just been told it started in the 1940s, which is quite an impressive, uh, quite an impressive tradition. Um, I, uh, uh, it's my pleasure and honor to, um, to introduce Dr. Francisco Diego today. Now, I am Nick Lane. I'm a biochemist in the Department of Genetics, Evolution, and Environment. And you might wonder, why is a biochemist introducing an astronomer? Um, and, well, the answer is that Francisco is one of these uh, inspiring figures. There are, uh, there's something about UCL that attracts people like Francisco, <laughs> I'd like to say, and, and, and there's a handful of people here who, who really um, rise above uh, and, 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 and directly interact with, with, with people with, with outside UCL uh, who are really inspiring figures within UCL, and that's how I got to know Francisco some years ago now. So Francisco is an astronomer. He did his first degree, actually, in mechanical engineering uh, in Mexico City, uh, then went to the uh, Society for Astronomy of Mexico, uh, which was where he became acquainted with astronomy, and then to the planetarium Luis Ero, uh, again in Mexico City, then came to UCL to do his PhD here, and he's been at UCL ever since, to, to my knowledge. He's, uh, he's, a, he's a very prominent broadcaster, uh, he's, he's done films with people like Brian Cox and Stephen Hawking. Uh, he's he's a really an excellent communicator, as you'll find out yourselves if you don't know him already in a few minutes. He's been running at UCL um, for, for, for the last few years now, uh, the Your Universe Festival, which I've occasionally taken part in, and it's a really wonderful festival, and again, directly fronting uh, with, with, with uh, wider audiences across <coughs> London and further afield rather than just inside UCL. He's a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society and the vice president of the, um, the UK Association for Astronomical Education. Uh, the real reason I'm introducing him, though, relates to, I think, what he'll be talking about in part today, which is that he transcends disciplines, uh, and I think this is really important. He's an astronomer, but he's coming... He doesn't really see the boundaries between disciplines, and I think we're, we're now at a stage in science where... You know, there are no boundaries <coughs> in nature. Uh, there is no distinction between chemistry and physics and biology and so on. And, and, and to be a scientist is to be all of these things, and Francisco embodies that perhaps more than anybody else I know. So without more ado, uh, Dr. Francisco Diego, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Remember that title. Every single word is very carefully chosen there. We are going to deal with the uh, major questions about origins, about where things come from. We are going to explore the history of the universe, and we are going to conclude with our local history here, what we have here. Where do we come from? Where does our environment come from? How important are these things in the context of the cosmos, in the, con in the cosmological context? If we all go along history, we find the myths of creation. This comes from China. The universe was a big black egg. This one with Ra and uh, Tefnut and Nut and Geb and the goddess Nut with her body covered with stars. This one more familiar with uh, to us uh, a bit more boring about the creation of, uh, of the world. And there let be light, he said. This is more interesting, comes from North America, about the Tawa, the sun god, and the spider woman, the earth goddess. This one from Australia with the rainbow serpent, the creator of the world, the creator of plants, the creator of nature, the creator of humans. And this other one from India, very symbolic, with the strength of the elephant, the longevity of the turtle, and the eternity of the Ouroboros, the self-consuming snake. <coughs> Today we have other explanations based on fact about the origin of everything. As beautiful as these myths are, they are not true, but they are beautiful, and they are part of our cultural heritage. The mind of a little child leaving behind every preconceived notion and then show humility. 
Humility before nature. Nature leads the way. We are not going to tell nature how nature should be. Nature is telling us the way she is, and we have to find out. That's our duty here, to find out how nature works. OK, vamos in, uh, 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 beginning with uh, the fundamental concept that we have here. A complex city is a diverse uh, set of structures, uh, very complex, apparently. But if we go closer, we have a pattern emerging. And the pattern may be the same in all these complicated structures that we saw before. So all these bricks are virtually identical, and they can assemble themselves to produce these uh, complex uh, environments that we have like cities. Even smaller, we go to grains of uh, sand or clay, and we realize that uh, the whole thing comes to a gra grains of sand. This is the analogy of the universe. The universe comes from uh, complex structures, diverse structures, and it reduces to very simple structures. And there is a sequence here. Obviously, we have to have the sand first in order to have the bricks. We have to have the bricks in order to have walls, in order to have houses, in order to have cities. There is a sequence. We cannot say, let that be a city. It doesn't work like that. It has to be assembled. Not created, but assembled. That's very important. Another analogy, uh, water. How small can water be? How small? What is the minimum amount of water? In each of these little droplets, I don't know, like uh, this one here, there will be trillions of water molecules. What is a water molecule? An atom of oxygen, two atoms of hydrogen, H2O. How small is that molecule? I will show you this analogy. I have seen it for, for many other presenters that use it all the time. And it is very powerful because it tells us how science has made this progress, finding out about the magic of the smallest things and the largest things in the universe. A glass of water. How many molecules are in that glass of water? Well, at least in the primary school, the kids say trillions, billions, or something. <laughs> and here I get dead silence. I mean. <laughs> Remember this analogy. There are more glasses of water. There are more molecules of water in that in that glass, the glasses of water in all the oceans in the earth. You imagine that number. How many glasses of water in all the oceans? All of them. There are more molecules there. To give an idea how small things can be, and we know that. Now, it's made out of oxygen, the red one, and the white, the hydrogen. Where do we get them from? Where do we get these atoms from? Where do they come from? How do they get together? It's not the molecule, it's not made, it's not made, it is assembled. Remember that, assembled. You have to put the atoms together. Where does that happen? And where do they get the atoms in the first place? These are the fundamental questions that we are going to deal with before we go into the development of, uh, of the universe until we get to today. OK, let's start. Let's remember what T.H. Huxley said about uh, the getting rid of the preconceived notions and showing humility before nature. And this is what we have found. We go to origins, and the origins of origins, we have done a lot of work in these uh, few decades, and we know that the universe, this picture of the universe, will look something like this. And that was the only act of creation ever. This is the Big Bang, so-called the Big Bang. Don't have time to go into these details here. I have a timeline here in front of you. Uh, in the normal scale, this should be a millimeter for, for every million years. OK? That's a million years there. So that is 1,000 million years, 2,000 million years, OK, until we get to more or less 14,000 millimeters, or 14,000 million years. Just to give an idea, because I ask you, can you imagine 14,000 million years? I cannot. You have to see them somehow in a timeline. And still, it's a, it's a big, big, uh, big struggle. The Big Bang is primordial energy. It comes like. Uh, 
a, a period of nothing, violating all the laws of physics that we know today. There are laws of physics that are not violated, obviously, by this uh, event, the Big Bang. The expansion of the universe starts at that point, 14,000 million years ago or whatever, and then it's pure energy. There is no stars, no nothing. It's just energy, no particles, no atoms, nothing, just energy. For a small fraction of a second, trillions, 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 billions of a second, then the energy is transformed into fundamental particles, many more, but these are the ones that are interested for the universe that we can see. We call them quarks and electrons. They're fundamental. You cannot break them and get something inside them. You get energy. So these are the grains of sand of the universe. This is the fundamental building blocks. Whatever there is in the universe that you can see is made out of this. Everything, absolutely everything that you can see. There is a universe we cannot see. That's a different story. So, quarks and electrons appear in our uh, development of complexity here. The complexity grows as this inverted pyramid goes. And then uh, I put this in orange because these are the fundamental particles like a uh, Lego bricks that need to be assembled together. And in order to do that, we need different kinds of glue. We have the super glue, which is the strong force. We have the weak glue, the weak force, and then the electromagnetic glue and gravity. These four forces that we know in nature that are going to interact with these particles and put them together. The process of assembly goes uh, very quickly. In a billionth of a second, the super glue is able to confine quarks in threes. You get the combined charges here. You get protons, neutrons, and electrons. So in a billionth of a second, the universe, after the Big Bang, in a billionth of a second, a billionth of a second, OK? The universe has put together all the protons, all the neutrons, all the electrons of all the atoms of the entire universe. You got that? I don't. <laughs> I just read it. OK. And then the process of assembly takes another step. That superglue is going to bring together protons and neutrons to have the, uh, the primordial nuclear fusion of protons and neutrons. It's called fusion because they get together. And it's not called nuclear because this particles that are the result of that fusion are going to appear in the nuclei of atoms that are still to be formed. So we're still in the very first millimeter of our timeline. In about 400,000 years, which is half a millimeter, the electromagnetic glue brings together the electrons to the nuclei. The number of protons defines the type of chemical element, one for hydrogen, two for helium, three for lithium, and then we have some neutrons there just helping the whole thing to, to stay stable. As many protons as electrons we have here, these are the uh, very first atoms that will appear and emerge out of the Big Bang. Very simple chemistry by then. I emphasize the, the, the structure of the atom. We are going to do that uh, uh, in a minute in more, in more, in, in more uh, specific way. So this is the first millimeter of our timeline, and that's all that there is in the universe. Don't look for planets or galaxies or anything. That's it, the first millimeter. Then we have the dark ages. The dark ages, uh, the universe keeps expanding and cooling down, and the dark ages are uh, a kind of mystery. Nothing happens there apart from the universe expanding and cooling down. It's, a, it's a, just a black universe, which is uh, getting colder and colder and expanding, and it's just a dark cloud of hydrogen and helium, mainly. And after that, uh, uh, from that dark cloud, we have gravity now. The gravity uh, force is going to bring that cloud together in millions and millions of places to form the very first generation of stars. And this is what happens uh, when the universe is about four, five, six hundred million years. So we are talking now about this long in our timeline. So this is proper proper scale there, the first stars. <coughs> Carl Sagan very famously said, if you want a chocolate cake, you have to make the universe first. So that is what is happening here. 
Now we have the stars. What are the stars doing? The stars are very hot in the center. At those temperatures of millions of degrees here, that process of nuclear fusion continues in a more stable way. And then we have the possibility of bringing these particles, protons and neutrons, together by larger numbers. You have four, you have beryllium, you have six, you have carbon, eight, oxygen, etc. This is what the stars do because they have a long, uh, very high pressure, a very high temperature in the center, millions of degrees. So the atom of carbon, six, six, and six. Six protons, six neutrons, six electrons. Remember that, that picture. Those stars don't live very long time. They live a few million years and they explode in supernova explosions. And those explosions are the environment at thousands of millions of degrees where the nuclear fusion continues for a very short period of time. So this is where the superglue is going to, I mean, how long? Let's give them, I don't know, three, four hundred million years. That's plenty for the stars to be able these, these stars are very, they, should, they, live, they really live very short lives. Now the number of protons and neutrons increases because of these high temperatures allow that to happen, the protons and neutrons getting together. Process of assembly, remember that. And that's where we get the heavy chemical elements. Here we have, well, the lighter ones, we have carbon and oxygen. Here we have gold, silicon, uranium, uh, 79 for gold, protons, uranium, 90, uh, 82 protons, 92 protons. So heavy atoms. We are building the periodic table. The stars, during their lives, and especially at the end of their lives, are developing the chemistry. The stars. Those of you, I hope not, those of you that believe in astrology, <laughs> this is the real astrology. This is what the stars do for us all the time, produce chemical elements. Because without chemical elements, there is no life, there is no planet, there is nothing. So this is where the chemical elements are, even at small amounts, because the universe is still domi dominated by hydrogen and helium, but all these uh, chemical elements are traces, but enough to make the universe interesting. Imagine a universe made out of hydrogen and helium. I mean, come on, how boring is that? <laughs> this is the chemistry that comes from the Big Bang. This is the chemistry, more or less, give or take a few elements, that comes when the stars are still alive, all the way down to 26 iron. And all these are the chemical elements produced after or during or after the deaths of the stars. And we have them available here, perhaps uh, two, or, two, or three, one or two, yeah, two or three billion years after the Big Bang. They are available there. Well, in the universe, gravity takes over and starts collapsing these clouds and producing new generations of stars, which now will contain the part of this, of this material. Some molecules appear in, uh, in these clouds, which are the remains of stars. Here we have the famous, uh, where is it, water. That water, that's where the water is put together. And we have other things here, like ammonia, methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, etc. Gravity brings together these clouds and then produces new generations of stars and planets. Now we have metals. Now we have silicates. Now we have carbides. We have solid material out of which we can produce rocks. Where is it? I have a... Uh, one of them, we call them meteorites. This one is made out of iron and nickel, one of those chemical elements there. So this is what makes planets, I mean proper planets, I mean solid planets. So um, our complexity and diversity keeps expanding and we are now in this process, let me just put this uh, here. This is the building site of a solar system, a star with planets around it. Not ours, but the possibility of solar systems was already there when the universe was a quarter or a third of the present age. And uh, there will be planets there. Let me see where is the... Uh, there should be aliens in those planets. <laughs> Give them a few million years, I mean a thousand million years to develop and do something. That process of star formation, of, of, of planet formation, is very common in the universe. There will be millions and trillions of events like this one happening almost simultaneously along this timeline. 
There will be trillions and trillions of possibilities of aliens to be there, already there when the universe was there. Chemistry was there, conditions were there. They have no excuse not to be there. <laughs> and many of them actually, oh, another one here, just to, <laughs> just to make the point, yeah? Uh, how does it go? How do you put an alien on a timeline? With no props, hey, there you go. Okay. However, these aliens have to do something because, as we know, that star is not forever. That star is going to explode in a super, or super well, not exactly supernova explosion. It's going to end its life in a kind of tragic way. So they have to avoid the destruction of their own solar system. Otherwise, they will be part of that cloud. As it will be in our case, if we, if we uh, uh, keep on this planet long enough, that will come, that point will come when the sun uh, dies, and with the death of the sun is the death of the planets, and we, if we're still here, we will be part of the cloud that, uh, that was the sun one day. But in this case, these clouds keep recycling, gravity keeps putting them together, and now we have the formation of our own solar system. I bring my meteorite here now. Our solar system was formed. I mean, these are shorter meters because their timeline is a bit. One, two, three, four thousand. Four thousand. Five hundred and sixty six. <laughs> million years old. And we know that because we do chemical analysis, isotopic ratios in meteorites like this one, and we can tell this meteorite was gas. It solidified about that time, 4,566 million years ago. Give or take, or most of meteorites give you that, that number. The age of the solar system, the age of the sun, the age of the Earth. Now we are coming to the interesting part, the Earth. A very violent place. That solar system was full of collisions, destructive collisions, but also constructive mergers of, uh, of bodies, of meteorites, of asteroids, of planets that get together. In this case, the Earth suffers a collision with another planet, almost the same size, and from that collision, we know now, it comes the Moon. And the Moon is extremely important. The result of that collision is that the axis of the Earth is tilted, and the gyroscopic effect of the Moon going around the Earth keeps that axis tilted with the same angle, which is very important to keep kind of weather stability for millions of years, which is what we need in order to go further and use the atom of carbon now to complicate the situation. I mean, complicate to make it more interesting, I would say, more challenging. Our planet was a greenhouse, a greenhouse planet uh, with simultaneous volcanic eruptions, with electric storms, all kinds of nasty things. It was held. So you want to, <laughs> if you want to rewrite the Bible, you have to say, in the beginning, the Earth was hell. And any vision of hell that we can imagine is short of what it really was. From that hell, from that enormous violence that we have with these greenhouse gases making the Earth extremely hot, and also with volcanic eruptions that were happening uh, in the oceans and the, and the bottom of the oceans, we have the chemistry. Electromagnetic force is going to bring molecules together by the millions, by the trillions, and eventually we get the most, uh, one of the most, uh, I, don't, I don't know if this is the most complex, it's the most beautiful, I would say, and it is the common denominator of life, which is uh, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, which is made of six molecules, small molecules, uh, the four bases and the sugars and the phosphates, which are outside, and this is what DNA is. This is the color code for the atoms. This is phosphorus that you can find outside here in the helicoidal part, and the other ones are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Um, which are part of the bases, which are in the, in the middle here. <coughs> I want to say something that perhaps, uh, uh, I hope, uh, Nick, is <laughs> um, every single living thing on this planet is based on DNA from the very beginning. So that DNA is the common denominator, is what makes us the same. Let me put the Earth here as it was, or as we think it was. 
and then we have the DNA, which is a molecule. It's very simple. It's only five atoms, only six molecules, but it goes on and on and on. And if the DNA was at that scale, it would be the size of the solar system, I would say, that molecule there, because the uh, bases don't repeat themselves in the same place, in the same order. They're changing the orders, and that is the, what makes the, the uh, uh, biology so interesting and by far the most challenging uh, part of science. Uh, uh, biology and what is going on in little cells is, is fascinating. <coughs> uh, it's a replicator. It can reproduce itself. It's one of the characteristics for life. And uh, at that time, it was encapsulated in membranes to produce the very first cells, proper cells, the archaea and, uh, and uh, prokaryotic cells that appear, as you can see, very quickly in a few hundred million years, or ha yeah, a few hundred million years after the formation of the solar system, we already have life. That could have been the case here. We don't know. It's very difficult. It's, going to be, it's impossible to get evidence for that. But we know the conditions were there. And life at this level of, uh, of, uh, of cells that cannot do anything else apart from being their own individuals is, uh, is, is probably very common in the universe. Primitive life. What these cells do? Some of them that live in the oceans have the ability to photosynthesize, have the ability to wipe out the carbon dioxide that was very abundant in the, in the atmosphere of the Earth at that time, and free oxygen in the atmosphere. Change what was hell, as I told you. This was hell, and that hell becomes paradise. So another thing to write in your Bible is that the paradise, we owe the paradise to cyanobacteria, to blue-green algae that are still doing that as we speak. Now, how cool is that? Will you build a church to the cyanobacteria and go and worship them? <laughs> this is easy. This was fast. The next step is very difficult. Let me put paradise here. By the way, this paradise didn't come that quick. Those cyanobacteria have to work for about uh, one or 2,000 million years in order to produce paradise. So paradise is not that easy to make. And this is where uh, these kind of processes to be replicated here are going to be uh, very difficult. So we have now the eukaryotic cell. The eukaryotic cell is a kind of colony of bacteria inside each other. And this is a cell that is a eukaryotic cell because it has a nucleus, it has organelles, it has internal membranes, it has uh, uh, chloroplasts and mitochondria and all kinds of other things that make the cell extremely important to make, to assemble themselves into organisms like plants and animals, what we will call complex life that was so well uh, studied by uh, Darwin and Wallace. And Darwin started writing in his book, and remember this, I think, this is the most important thing, especially the young members of the audience. This is the most important thing in life, is to think, to put things together. Even this society doesn't want you to think. You have to overcome that power. You have to think, because that's how we come to these amazing, beautiful, beautiful things. So the eukaryotic cell doesn't come that quick either. It will take another thousand million years, of, uh, one and a half thousand million years. This is today, by the way. And look, where we are. There are no animals yet until we get the ammonites a few hundred million years ago. Is my ammonite here? And ammonites were dominating with many other species here in the oceans until, that's so far for biology, for natural selection, for evolution. But what we have, this tree of life, that was developing in each of these branches is a species, you know? But the tree of life was chopped down 250, 260 million years ago. 95% was it? Extinction? Extinction, 95%. 95% so, yeah. species were made extinct, almost like this, by chance. And this is important. Luckily, the survivors were able to produce another tree. The tree is different. It's a tree. It has branches, but the branches are different. Ammonites, we, I think they survived this one, but trilobites didn't. 
and the ammonites will survive and then uh, roam the earth. Uh, this is where the dinosaurs come from. Okay, dinosaurs. And then run out of time here in the timeline. We are talking 200 million years ago. And uh, very famously, now we have more evidence for this event. 64 million years ago, an asteroid the size of uh, 10 kilometers, more or less, impacts what is today the Gulf of Mexico and wipes out 75%, I think, of the species in that, uh, in that uh, cataclysmic collision, including the dinosaurs and some sharks and some other species survive, especially species in the oceans manage to survive. So a new tree develops again by chance. All these are chance events. If you remove any of these events from history, nothing of this will be happening. Something else will have happened, of course, also by chance. And this is where we come from. This is where the mammals have a chance to, to flourish, to, to really, uh, after being repressed by the dinosaurs, they are finally have a chance to, to flourish. And this is where we come from. The present tree of life, one of them, as many versions you can find in the internet, but it is amazing the amount of uh, species that we have here. All the ones that we have in this part here are microscopic, and here is where we have the plants and animals there. And this, if you find out where are we in this, well, it's somewhere there in the chordata. These are the ones that have spinal cord, vertebrates. <laughs> That's where we are. Remember Huxley when he has to humility. This is a big lesson from humility. That's what we are, little tweak there. So we come in the last uh, few million years, humans have evolved, and there are many species that became extinct in that process. And uh, this is where we are today, Homo sapiens. And the distance between the beginning of Homo sapiens and today in space is in time, is the thickness of this piece of paper there in our timeline. That's another lesson of humility. So the complexity of the universe comes now to the culminating, uh, culminating with brains, which is all made out of quarks and electrons. Remember that. It's just a process of assembly along this, this timeline. I'm going to finish now by um, talking a little bit of ourselves, a little bit of our uh, environment. Our five races are different on the surface, but identical. If we remember where we come from, strong evidence that all humans come from central part of Africa, here, and my, my globe here to show you that. We come from a place between Tanzania and Kenya, that sort of area there. And by migration, in capital letters, by migration, we populate Asia and Europe. And eventually, by migration, we populate America. It's a continent, America, OK? Continent of America. Remember that. The United States is only one country. <laughs> out of 36, I think, countries, okay? And what happened? This came from the Strait of Bering uh, 20,000, 30,000 years ago, populated America, and the Europeans took the ships and crossed the Atlantic and found them in the way. They failed to recognize each other. They were the same. They came from the same place in different routes. And look what happens today. We still fail to recognize each other. Big tragedy. Chemical composition, that's the DNA with calcium for the bones. Not very different from the dinosaur, really. DNA, our DNA is the same of all living species, about 50%. Uh, with the apes, we are 98.6%, similar to the chimpanzee. We are apes as well, this is the gibbon, orangutan, uh, chimpanzee, this one, gorilla, and man. So similarities are astonishing. This is what science is telling us. If we look at our environment, beautiful environment, 
What are we doing with it? I'll keep quiet now. Why is that? Is the greed of a few and the ignorance and apathy of the many? Nothing else. And then we have to invoke the wisdom of our ancient cultures, of those myths. They didn't know about quarks and electrons. But they have a lot of wisdom. And we better use that wisdom that lives in harmony with each other, in harmony with nature. And they say, we have a state of life that calls for another way of living. If we take precious things from the land, we will invite disaster. This is the wisdom of ancient cultures that didn't know about galaxies or anything. A state of life that calls for another way of living. So, what we have now, more and more unfortunately, is this. The economy is the top of the importance in human activities and is feeding from humanity and from the natural environment. So very simple, just put it the other way around. So the economy is going to feed humanity and is going to feed the natural environment. Very simple. How you do that? That is the problem. We have education, as uh, Nick said just now. We have projects that are educating kids about uh, all this that we have been talking about with the molecules, with the structure of atoms, the periodic table made up of biscuits. And uh, all this kind of thing, we need to really have a very strong, a very strong uh, movement, actually, of education to, to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you, Francisco, for a masterpiece. We have a few minutes for some questions. Uh, there are microphones, so please wait for a moment until the microphone is arriving. First question here, please. If, if we go back um, to the quarks and electrons as we are, are capable of, is it possible for us to use some form of fission to create, briefly, the primordial energy? Um, because what is it? That is the thing we don't know, isn't it? Um, to break the, the quarks, I was told once that you need a particle accelerator the size of the galaxy that sort of energy. I think it was the, the idea, yeah? No. So the answer is no, <laughs> essentially, yeah. 
So we have to accept that we don't know what primordial energy is or where it came from? Well, it is uh, uh, one of the places, the, the Planck era is one of the regions, the, uh, the epochs of the universe that we know very little. It violates the laws of physics and the, all this little space, so we need to find out a lot more in there. Yeah. Could you pass the microphone I'm just thinking about the probability of life elsewhere, so that if life happened once in four billion years with the chance occurrence of a self-replicating molecule on this planet, can you work out a probability that it might have happened again in terms of what we estimate as other livable planets in the universe? Uh, yes. Um, it didn't take that long. I mean, primitive life only took a few hundred million years here, okay, to have bacteria. But, uh, and then what follows is a long chain of uh, cataclysmic events, accidental things, and uh, really uh, events that happen, for example, in the case of the uh, transformation or the, uh, or the um, uh, assembly of, uh, of uh, bacteria into eukaryotic cells, is something that happened only once, only one place. And it is a miracle, essentially. So to have these events replicated elsewhere in the universe is going to be extremely difficult, despite that we have trillions and trillions of planets. Oh, thank you very much for the lecture. It was very enjoyable. Um, I am wondering, you hinted earlier on about the things we do know, the, the, the parts of the universe we do know. Um, obviously, there's a lot of research into what we don't know currently that's out there. Um, do you have a, an instinct, uh, a gut feeling at all? <laughs> um, no, I better than go into that, but... Uh, um, I have to say, what we have seen here is 4% of the universe, okay? There is 96% that we don't know what it is. Most of it is dark energy, and a lot of that is six times more matter that we can see here, which is called dark matter. It should be called transparent matter, which is what it is, and we still don't know. So, uh, let alone the Big Bang and let alone many other things. But what we know is not bad already. I mean, this is quite... <laughs> I mean, in this, uh, where is, in, this, in this amount of time, in this amount of time, we have achieved so much. I mean, it's a sense of pride, of course. It's humility, but I'd say, look what he have done. We should keep going. There's plenty of timeline there to continue in the future. So future generations can take over and then find out more things. But certainly, uh, lots of things we don't know. Stephen Hawking very, very famously said in one uh, interview, he, he had an event in, uh, in, um, in the Royal Albert Hall. Jim Al-Khalili was uh, chairing that meeting, and he said, uh, well, there were uh, recorded questions at the end from the audience, pre-recorded, and he, he had pre-recorded his, he was in his wheelchair by then. And um, la last question, Dr. Hawking, do you think that one day we will know everything about everything? What was his answer? I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, thank you. Uh, my question is about parallel universes. I have heard from quantum physics that if you have quarks, they seem to be in multiple places at the same time. Uh, it's like one of these arguments to explain that they might exist. So I just want to know what is your take on that, on parallel universes? Uh, you cannot say no. It's a possibility. A lot of uh, astronomers, cosmologists are advocating a possibility of uh, several universes existing with their own timelines, with their own things, independently and simultaneously. But um, if we're thinking about ways of, of, uh, of um, trying to learn more about the universe, that doesn't show, solve anything. You can call all, the, co all the, the, com the, the, the combination of all those universes, you can call the universe. So you are back to square one. It's, it's like the turtle, you know the turtle. The world supported by elephants, the elephants supported by a turtle. What is supporting the turtle? <laughs> it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> and that's the question. You, in infinite regression, it's impossible. You have to be very careful. I mean, uh, philosophers that went very, really seriously into these depths became mad. So you have to be, <laughs> have to be careful. Well, I think on now, that point, let me sorry. Let me just one minute, because okay. I forgot to do this. Look at the amount of, look at the amount of water here, OK? There it is. This globe is 30 million times smaller than the Earth. At this scale, 
Mount Everest will be a quarter of a millimeter high. The atmosphere will be two millimeters thick and the oceans will be paper thin deep. The amount of water in all the oceans on Earth will be this here. That's all the water we have on Earth at this scale. When we say there is a lot of water in the oceans, think about that. This is how easy it is to destroy the environment and we are doing very well, very efficiently. This we have to, we have to bear in mind, the amount of water we have in the, in the ocean. I'm afraid we have to stop there because there's another lecture coming in, I think, afterwards. So thank you very much for coming and thank you, thank you. Francisco Diego. Thank you, Nick. Thank you.